Good afternoon. Here we are on a very beautiful Sabbath day as we are assembled together once again to observe this day and to keep it holy with the Eternal's blessing. It is good to be able to see all of you here this day and to deliver an, uh, this sermon to all of us. I am appalled at, the, at what has been said this past few weeks when it comes to the problems in this nation. No one seems to want to take credit for the downfall in the economy. No one wants to seem, seem to take cr credit for the immigration problem or any other situation in this country. It's not my fault. In fact, I've been told that it was because of the Arab uprising that we're still in a recession. Or maybe it was because of the tsunami that wiped out Japan's nuclear power plants and limited the, the amount of parts that we were receiving. That's what caused this nation to, to continue to be in, in an economic collapse. It's everybody else's fault, but it's certainly not mine. And I was appalled that the leader of this great nation would come to those term, terminology, would say that, that he was not responsible. The president is not responsible for the direction of the nation. Isn't he the chief CEO? Isn't he the executor? Isn't he the one who's in charge to see that the laws are carried out and, en and enacted and obeyed and upheld? Surely. Someone should take the blame, right? But no, we live in a generation where no one wants to accept blame for anything that goes wrong. It's not my fault. It just isn't. It's the way I was brought up. Am I to blame my parents? Am I to blame somebody else? Maybe, but not me. I'm innocent. In fact, I'm perfect. The decisions that I make are always right. The situations that I see are not because of what I've done. It's not my fault that the car engine blew up. It's not my fault that I had an accident yesterday. It's not my fault that the roof blew off the house. It's just not my fault. I don't have to deal with it. You all have to deal with it. I'm above the fray. I'm above the riprap. I'm above all that's around me because I'm the king. Is that how we're supposed to act? Is that how we're supposed to conduct our lives? To always point the finger at somebody else? Always look for someone else to blame? Well, it seems like that's the foot that mankind got off on many, many years ago, nearly 6,000 years ago. Because God created Adam and Eve. He began this plan of salvation where mankind would have the opportunity to be born into the family of God. To be a part of his creation. Not this physical creation forever and ever, but to be in his spiritual creation. To be a child, a son, a daughter of God Almighty. The Ancient of Days. He's the creator. He's creating you and me to be born into his family. He started with Adam and Eve. And all things was well until that upright creature came by and enticed Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve did, gave it to Adam, he ate, and who did they blame? Who did they blame? God came to Adam. We know the story. God came to, came to Adam. What did he say? It's not my fault. It's what God said, heard from Adam's voice. It's not my fault. Well, whose fault is it? You can just imagine the conversation, right? We have a, just a little inkling into it. Yes, what, did, what did God say? Well, who, what happened? Why do you think you're naked? Why, who told you all this? 
did you eat of something I said you wasn't supposed to? And they, well, Adam lost his, his uh, words there for a moment. And then he got his thoughts together. And guess what? The blame game was on. Who hasn't played that game? Who hasn't? We've all played the game. So, of course, Adam blamed Eve. But in blaming Eve, who was Adam actually blaming? Yes, you're right. He was blaming God. It's your fault, God. You created Eve. And now, if you had created something else, if you had done it a different way, I wouldn't be in this situation. So when we begin to blame others, others who are created in the image of God, we end up, in reality, blaming God. But is God at fault? Has God ever made a mistake? Is he guilty? Never. It's us that are guilty. And we don't want to accept the responsibility of those mistakes that we have made. And so we look for someone else to blame. And Adam blamed Eve. She did it. She gave me the piece of fruit and I ate. It's her fault. Of course, God goes to Eve. <coughs> Since Adam passed the buck, so to speak, Adam should have admitted to the fact that I, and I alone. No one forced me to eat it. I ate it of my own free will. But he didn't admit it. He did not admit his guilt. Eve. And poor Eve, what's she going to say? Well, she says, the serpent beguiled me. And that's exactly what the Bible says Eve was deceived. She allowed herself to fall into deception. Adam was not. He knew better. Eve was deceived. Because the serpent, that is Satan speaking through this upright creature, spun a story, a tale, a yarn that was a mile long and sounded good. It pleased her ears. Who wouldn't want to be wise and know everything? And so she blamed the upright creature. And as the jokes goes, that serpent did have a leg to stand on. That's what happened. Legs got cut out from underneath that upright creature. Of course, they were guilty before God. And mankind has played that game ever since. It's part of human nature. It's a part of who we are. Because without God's Spirit, that's exactly what we do. When we have a fender bender, it's not my fault. It was the other driver's fault. Even when the evidence is plainly clear that I'm the one that made the error. It got so bad in the United States with insurance companies that they finally said, we've had enough of this. So they come up with the term called no-fault insurance. We'll pay for your accident, and the other insurance company will pay for that accident, and there won't be this suing among the companies. No-fault insurance. Because before that, turn in the claim, the insurance or the person's insurance company would go then and sue the other insurance company for the, for the amount of damages. So they said, no fault. We don't want all that legality. Don't want it. Too much of a hassle. So it's nobody's fault when there's an accident. It just happened. The stars were turned in a certain direction, aligned with the moon and all the rest of the universe, and it just happened. I got out of bed on the wrong footing, but it's still not my fault. Had a bad night, but it's not my fault. Well, God makes the point very plain if we turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 13. 
We know the story of the children of Israel. Or at least we should if we're biblically literate. We've been studying God's word. We understand their exodus out of Egypt and how they went over into the promised land after 40 years of wandering around, blaming everybody else for their mischief and their misfortune and their, all their mistakes. You can just imagine what Moses had to deal with in trying to bring those people through the wilderness and to the promised land. But Joshua took them over, established them up as a, as a country, as a nation, and God was their ruler. The one we know of is Jesus Christ. He was their king. He was their savior. He was the one that they worshipped. And they run the government. He had set up the priesthood to teach the law of God. But who thundered the law of God down from Mount Zion? It was Jesus Christ, the Word, the God of the Old Testament. So after a while, the people got tired of listening to God. Didn't want God to talk to them anymore. They wanted a king. They wanted someone that they could look to, to take their problems to, to, to deal with the situation, just like the other nations. They wanted a man sitting on a throne that would tell them what to do. And so God warned them through Samuel, and they said, no, we still want a king. Here we come to chapter 13 of 1 Samuel. Verse 1. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, he began to build an army. The nation was being afflicted by the Philistines. There was no recourse, so God appointed Saul to be king. He stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was a gigantic man. He commanded a lot of authority just by walking into the room because he was a man of height, of statute. Dropping down here, we come to verse 8, and they're in a quandary, they're in a predicament. Saul's only got a few thousand men. The Philistines have been afflicting them. And Samuel says to wait six days, actually seven days, wait seven days and I'll come to you. Can you imagine, you've just been king, this is your second year, and this is all new. This is new territory. How, how am I supposed to conduct my life as a king? Samuel was the instructor. Samuel had laid out all these directions as far as telling the nation what would happen when they put someone in as king. So here we have Saul, king. And Samuel says, wait seven days. First Samuel chapter 13 verse 8. Saul waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel doesn't show up. And the Philistines are getting closer. You can hear the Sabers rattling, the swords gleaming in the sunlight. They're marching, they're coming. What am I supposed to do, Saul says. Samuel doesn't show up. So, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. My army's deserting. They're hiding in rocks and caves. They're just leaving me, and I'm standing here all by myself, so to speak. Now, what am I supposed to do? Well, Saul said to himself, well, okay. Then he tells someone, bring me, bring me the burnt offering. That's it. Bring the peace offerings over here. I'll do it. After all, I'm king. I should be able to handle this situation. So he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he offers the burnt offering, guess what? Samuel shows up. Was the seven days over? Of course not. No. Samuel came when he said he would come. Samuel's not a liar. He's a servant of God. God doesn't lie. Samuel told the king, wait seven days. 
Well, he got to the seventh day and Samuel didn't show up. So Saul ran out of patience, ran out of whatever else he could come up with is to stall and says, I guess I got to do it myself. It's just, it's just like when Moses go up on the mountain of God. And the people said, we don't know what happened to Moses. He's not coming back. Whether it was 10 days later or 20 days later, Moses hasn't shown up. They figure he's gone. It's over. It's history. We need a God. And so Aaron makes a golden calf. Whose fault was it? God was going to kill Aaron. Aaron knew better. And Moses interceded on behalf of Aaron. What did Aaron say? He said, well, I just threw the gold in the fire. I just threw the gold in the fire and all of a sudden here's his golden calf. What an excuse. But that's what he said. I'm, I'm innocent. I asked for gold. They gave me the gold. Here's the fire. I threw it in. And woof. Magic. Now he was more involved than that. And Moses knew it. And God knew it. And God was going to kill Aaron until Moses interceded. Well, here's Saul. He takes into his hands that which he's not supposed to do. It's the responsibility of the priesthood. It's the responsibility of the priesthood to offer the offerings. Who was the priest? Samuel. Where did he grow up? In the house of God. At Shiloh, the tabernacle, the tent, with the Ark of the Covenant. He was the servant of God. He was God's anointed. He was the intercessor between God and the people, not the king. Oh, no. The king and the people were to answer to Samuel because what? Samuel was the servant of the living God. If Samuel said, wait seven days, you wait seven days. The sun sets and it's the eighth day, then you might have a leg to stand on. But you still can't do the offering. No, Samuel did come at the appointed time. Verse 10. Saul went out to meet Samuel and to greet him. Hey, everything's good now. And Samuel says, what have you done? Exactly what God told Adam. What have you done? What have you done? And Saul says, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you, it's your fault, Samuel, you didn't come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines were gathering together at Michmash. I was outnumbered. People were leaving me. You didn't show up when you told me you was going to come. What choice did I have? And I said, the Philistines would now come down on me. My life's, my life's in jeopardy. I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. I'm the king. They're going to kill me. And I haven't sought God. I haven't made any supplication to God. Did he need to offer an offering to make supplication to God? I don't think so. In fact, I know so. He could have asked God, where's Samuel? Help me through this ordeal. Help me have faith. What did, was he, what did God give him? His spirit. But Saul didn't use God's spirit. He allowed the circumstances around him to dictate to him what he should do. And when it failed, like some other people we know, when things fail, it's not my fault. But when everything goes well, in spite of not having anything to do with it, take all the credit for it anyway. What am I supposed to do, Samuel? Therefore, I felt compelled. I just had to do it and offer a burnt offering. 
Well, it was against God's law. So Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the eternal your God which he commanded you. For now the eternal would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now it's gone. We always thought, maybe if we hadn't studied God's word, it was the fact when he failed to destroy all the animals, and I'll get to that over here in chapter 15, that that's when God took the kingdom away from him. No, God took the kingdom away from Saul here. At this very stage in his life, two years, two years into his kingdom, and he blows it. He blows it. Why? Because he took matters into his own hands, and when he did it, he blamed everybody else and all the other circumstances but himself. If we would blame ourselves, then God does something differently about it. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we would look at our own lives and not play the blame game, God would see a different heart. Because there is no human being who's lived on this earth without sin. We all have our faults. It's just that we don't accept responsibility for our faults. If we did, we know this outcome would be different because we, all we have to do, and I don't have time today, is to look at David's life. He sinned against God. He He's, you know, you've not kept the commandment of God. That's what the prophet came into David and said, look, you've not kept the commandments of God. What David said, it's her fault. She was naked. Speaking of Bathsheba, right? It's Bathsheba's fault. She shouldn't be on the roof at night taking a bath or during the day or whenever. It's her fault. No, David did not say that. He says, against God and God alone I have sinned. He killed Uriah. Saw, D David knew exactly what the message was to the general. Put him in the front lines and then withdraw. What are going to happen? He's going to die. David said, me, I'm guilty. I'm the one who's guilty. God says, What's the difference in the outcome? Sin's taken away. God's forgiven. True, David then suffered for the rest of his life when his family was fighting amongst themselves, when Absalom threw him off the throne, when a daughter got raped by a stepbrother, that stirred up a lot of grief. David suffered consequences, but the sin was forgiven. Saul suffered consequences, but the sin was not forgiven. Because Saul did not seek forgiveness. He went through an action of penance. He told Samuel that on occasions, don't leave me, let's put up a big front here, you're still here at my side. Everything will look good. The people won't suspect anything. But God took the spirit from him and gave it to David. So we come to chapter 15. We come to chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. And in a sense, God's giving Saul another chance. But the kingdom's going to be gone. There were times when kings repented and God says, okay, it won't happen in your lifetime. It may not happen until the fourth generation. Saul's kingdom would have continued but not forever. The promise to David was that the kingdom would be forever. Big difference. 
God told David, you always have a descendant sitting on your throne and it will continue forever because Jesus Christ is a descendant of David and he will come and sit on that throne forever. And on top of that, David's going to be king over the tribe of Israel and the world tomorrow sitting on that throne. God doesn't lie. If we don't play the blame game, He forgives and the future is much, much better. Maybe not the immediate future, but the future in the kingdom, the goal, the purpose of why we're here, why God created us, will be fulfilled. Saul never got the picture. He never did. He was always thinking about himself, how good he was, how great he was, how important he was. So here we are in chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed, heed, obey the voice of the words of the eternal. That's it. That's all we need to do. Wake up, smell the roses, listen to God, and obey Him. Easier said than done. Of course, God told Saul through Samuel, go destroy the Amalekites because of what they did to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Destroy them. Attack them. Wipe them out. Totally. Man, woman, infant, nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, donkey. Leave nothing. Total annihilation. Drop a nuclear bomb on him, so to speak. That's what all Saul had to do. Did Saul not have the, the military capability? Was he 50 tanks too short? Did he have not enough helicopters? Did he not have enough machine guns? Did he not have enough swords, spears, horses, chariots? What did he lack? Nothing. God was not giving him an impossible mission. He was to go and do it. How many did he take with him? Verse 4. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men from Judah. That's an army. It's almost a quarter of a million. Logistics. How would you like to have to feed that kind of army? There's a lot of logistics into putting together a military might of this strength, but it's what was needed to go and attack the Amalekites. So you would have thought the job would have been simple. But it wasn't. Because the commandment from God did not go any further than to King Saul. He forgot, I guess, to tell his generals, to tell the people what to do. At least Saul blames the people. He didn't blame himself, but he blamed the people. Verse 9, but Paul, I mean, excuse me, but Saul, verse 9, and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. Was that what God said? Bring back the best. No. He said, wipe them all out. Put a nuclear bomb on them and get rid of them. They brought back the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and was unwilling to utterly destroy them. Oh, it was easy to destroy that which was worthless, that which was despised. Oh, yes. But you're going to destroy, leave the gold behind and the silver and the beautiful garments and weaponry and whatever else? No, they wasn't going to do it. Pride, vanity, lust, greed. This was an opportunity to get rich. Just like the man at Jericho. 
who caused the next campaign of Joshua to be a failure because he stole that which was not his. After all, the Amalekites belong to whom? The sheep and the oxen belong to whom? Doesn't God say every, every cattle on the hillside's mine? All of creation is mine? Of course he does. So is God being unfair? Is he to be blamed? God's not God's not thinking right. Why, why? That animal is good. It's got four good legs. It's got good teeth. Man, that makes some good, man, some good steak. I just can't wait to get that ox home. Well, man, it's strong. I need, I need it for my field. I got this acres back here to plow. You can imagine what's going through people's minds. To increase their wealth. And after all, God loves offerings. Why not bring back the best? That's what God wants. He says when we have a burnt offering or a sacrifice, give the best. So here's the best. Of course, God's seeing it all. And God has to go to his servant Samuel and say, uh-oh, we, we got a situation here. He says, I greatly regret. How would you like to receive a letter from God? Addressed to someone who says, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. Sad, isn't it? But would you and I be the recipients of the contents of this letter? Would the letter be addressed to the local minister who has to come to my door and tell me, I'm sorry, Joe, God has rejected you. Well, Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to separate the sheep and the goats and he's going to say, the sheep enter in, the goats I reject. Well, God says, I reject Saul. I'm sorry I even set him up. I made a mistake, he could say. God doesn't make a mistake in that way. It just that Saul did not obey God and what's God going to do? God's not going to force any one of us to obey him. Just doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen. I regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned his back. He's turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. He, I mean, he cried out to the eternal all night. It upset the minister. It upset the servant of God. It, he didn't sleep that night. He's like Moses. He's crying out to God, what, what can I do? What shall we do? What... You know? So Samuel gets up the next morning and goes to see Saul. <laughs> and Samuel comes down to Saul, verse 13. He says, Saul says to Samuel, Blessed are you of the eternal. Hey, isn't it great to see the minister? <laughs> I've performed the commandment of the eternal. I have been obedient this time. What a greeting. When the commandment was to totally wipe them out, Saul has the audacity to tell what? A lie. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We live in a political world that's the same thing. Look what I have done. Certainly not my fault. And Samuel says, well, why do I hear all this noise? The bleeding of sheep and lowering of oxen. Well, what's going on here, Saul? Tell me. Did you find these animals somewhere else on the path home? Or did you bring them back from the land of the Amalekites? And Saul says, I haven't done anything wrong. It's not my fault. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty, Samuel. The people did it. How do you like that? This country's not in an economic downfall because of me the people it's that group or some other party or something else has made it go bad it's not my fault we live in a society that's doing the same thing that Samuel's listening to Saul 
government. Government of and by the people, for the people, right? The children of Israel rejected the government of God. They wanted a king. They got a king. The king is doing it his own way. Not listening to God. Blaming everybody else. And so Saul says here in verse 15, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen, to sacrifice to the eternal of your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. That's right. We only brought back the best, and the people did that. And Samuel says, wait a minute, Saul. It's time to be quiet. As some people don't like the expression, it's time to shut up. You've said your speech. I don't want to hear it. It's not the truth. Now listen to what God's going to tell you. Because it's the truth. See, God doesn't lie. He doesn't pull any punches. He knows exactly what's going on in your life and my life and everybody else's life. We can either play the blame game or we get rid of the blame game and we do what's right. So he says, I will tell you what the Eternal said to me last night. And Saul says, okay, speak on. Ah, ah, I'm here. Ah, okay, okay. Can't be all that bad. It says, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Eternal anoint you king over Israel? Now let's go back to verse 12. There was a point in Saul's life that he was little in his own eyes. He wasn't playing the blame game. Didn't need to. He didn't think too much of himself. And God appointed him to be king. After all, he was out looking for what? Some lost animals of his dad's. When he came across Samuel, and Samuel said, you're the, you're the king. Verse 12. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he has set up a monument for himself. Might have been a statute, some type of trophy. He must have brought back something from the Amalekites that he set up to say, listen, here I am. This is who I am. I am successful. I am the king. This is my monument for posterity's sake. The King James doesn't have it very clear. New King James says he set up a monument. Some other version says he set up a monument like a trophy. Some type of prize. Something that would grandeurize himself. Something that would let people know who I am. Every time they walk by, they'll see this statue, they'll see this monument, they'll see this trophy, they'll see whatever it is. And praise the king. How great King Saul is. When you were little in your own eyes, then God was able to set you up as king. But now, you failed. Verse 19, Why then did you not obey the voice of the Eternal? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Eternal? Do you think Saul would have fell on his knees and cried out to Samuel and to God, I have sinned? It went in one ear and out the other. He had such a big head, such an ego, that he could do no wrong. That if anything went wrong, it was not his fault. He told Samuel, verse 20, I have obeyed the voice of the Eternal. Duh. Samuel just said you haven't. He retaliates and says, I have. I guess if you say it enough, it might become the truth, huh? 
That's what people think in this country. If you tell a lie long enough, repeat it over and over and over, it'll catch on and it'll be the truth. But a lie is a lie is a lie to the day there is no more physical universe. But the truth will always be. For Jesus Christ says, I am the truth, the way and the life. Samuel hears Saul saying, I'm innocent. It's not me. You've got the wrong person. I have obeyed God and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of the, Mal uh, the, the Malachites. I've obeyed God. The only person I spared was the king. But the people, verse 21. Yes. It's because conditions in the world are such that it's the fault of the Italians, it's the fault of the Greeks, it's the fault of the Spaniards, it's the fault of Europe, it's the fault of Asia, it's the fault of everybody else, but not this country, that we are in a recession. It's not because we don't obey God. It's not because we have sinned against God. It's not because we have thrown God out of the schools. It's not because we've thrown God out of the courtroom. It's not because we've done away with God. Oh, no, that's not, that's not the problem. That's not why we're having recessions. It's not why we're downfalling. No, it's everybody else's fault. And Saul said the people, they're the ones that's guilty, not me. This is dumbfounding if you really analyze it and to witness it in this nation, this very moment, this very week, this very month. That it's not my fault. So who will we blame? So who are we going to blame? When this nation goes into captivity, who are we going to blame? Well, things will get so bad at the end of the time that people will blaspheme God because God is intervening in the affairs of mankind to spare mankind's life from being totally annihilated. They're still angry with God. People blame God. And they don't want to admit it, so they take God out of the picture and blame everybody else but themselves for not having a relationship with God. See, the people brought it back. They were thinking that how much they could sacrifice to God. And Samuel says, verse 22, has the eternal as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the eternal. Better to obey than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the eternal with the word of the eternal, he has also rejected you from being king. And there's coming a time as God's going to say to the church, come, enter into the kingdom, be a, be a part of what I'm doing because I find you, what? Without spot and without blemish. I find you blameless. Not because we're not without sin, but that we're willing to admit that we are sinners and that we need God to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Saul says to Samuel, I've sinned. Finally, he gets to the point, he says, I've sinned, for I've transgressed the commandment of the eternal and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the eternal. 
He finally realized his hand was in the cookie jar and he got caught. But is he truly repentive? No. No. We may say, oh yeah, I know I've sinned. But go right back into it. Go right back to doing it. Because it has not been resolved. How many times did Saul transgress the commandment of God? Doesn't say. We have the, at least these two examples. It was enough for him to lose the kingdom. And we know that he died a very terrible death in battle. And that's sad. What about you and me? Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul was dealing with a congregation that has some very deep spiritual problems. There's divisions. There's fornication. There's judgment. People running around judging each other. There's gossip. There's backbiting. You name it. It's happening. This is the church in Corinth, in the great country of Greeks, where everything goes, where everything's allowed. This is the new age. We need to experiment. We need to find our inner selves. We need to have different kind of relationships. This is Corinth, the new world. The new opening. The coming out of the closet. This is it. And this is the church Paul has to deal with. It's not any different than today. He says, I thank my God, verse 4, always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. How many times did Samuel plead with God on behalf of Saul? He cried all night on many occasions. And one time God says, I'm sorry, Samuel. I've made a choice. I've made a decision. It's going to stand. Now get up off your bed. Stop crying. There's work to be done. Go to the house of Jesse and anoint one of his sons to be king. God has looked at the world. He spared Noah from that first world. He sent his son to establish the church and he's looking at you and me. And Paul says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. We've been given everything. We have God's Spirit. We are truly blessed beyond measure, enriched in everything. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse and his servants will fight. The kingdom will be established. But not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. Not everyone who proclaims the name of Jesus Christ will enter in. But those who are obedient to the word of God. Verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. For God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We are to be found blameless. Saul was not blameless. David was not blameless. They were both guilty before God. Adam and Eve were guilty before God. They were not blameless. 
you and I, as the servants of God, are to be blameless, without blame. So that when God looks at us, He doesn't see our faults. They're gone. Because He's removed them. He's wiped them out. And we appear before Him blameless. But if we're playing the blame game, we won't be found blameless. As you judge, so you will be judged. If you extend mercy, you shall receive mercy. If you blame, then I will find you without blame, or with blame, not blameless. I will find you with blame. You will be guilty as charged. Very serious. Very serious. Are we blameless? Second Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 10. <clears throat> but the day of the Lord will, not, will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's right. There's coming a time, <clears throat> not when Jesus Christ returns and sets up the kingdom. There's coming a time when all of mankind will have been given an opportunity to obey God. And it's coming. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are you and may be in holy conduct and godliness. Several years back, Mr. Trent gave a Bible study at the feast entitled The Games Christians Play. Playing the blame game was only one of them. Those who have access to the internet can look that message up. It's available. The games Christians play. You and I are to be looking for the coming of the day of the eternal. Isn't that what Abraham looked for? Our forefathers? They weren't looking for just a thousand year reign with Jesus Christ. They were looking for what? The new city. The new city. New Jerusalem. Far beyond this physical creation. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. When God Almighty comes out of heaven and comes down to be with Jesus Christ and His family. In the new heavens and the new earth. Because all that we see today will be on fire and will be dissolved and will, will melt. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, since we know it's coming, we have no excuse. We don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to playing the blame game. It's over. There's no one else to blame but ourselves. No one else to blame but ourselves. It's an individual relationship with God. We either obey God or we don't. Therefore, brethren, beloved people of God, verse 14, Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot, and blameless.
But you and I can't be blameless if we're running around blaming everybody else. It doesn't happen. It won't happen. So it's time. Time to confess. As they say, fess up. Not to me, but to God. Not to a local minister, but to God. To God, who is our creator. And tell him how much we've messed up. How much we're at fault for the situation that is in our hands. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, be submissive. Children, be obedient. The, the Word of God is loaded with commandments from cover to cover. It's just not the Ten Commandments. There's much, much more of how to deal with our neighbors and our friends and our relatives. To give willingly. To have an open heart, an open mind to, to the needs of others. To be compassionate. God expects us to be faithful in what he's done for you and me. He expected Saul to be faithful. He gave Saul some simple, simple commands. All he had to do was wait seven days. So all he had to do was wait seven days. The sun hadn't set. It wasn't the eighth day when Samuel showed up. No. It was still the seventh day. That's all we need to do. God hasn't expected us to move the earth and put it somewhere else in the universe. He doesn't expect us to cause the sun to shine. He doesn't expect us to let the clouds put down rain. That's in his control. That's in his hands. He expects us to do the little things. If you are faithful in what? Little things. Then you'll have authority over much things, greater things. But it's the little things. Don't eat of that fruit. It was no earth-shaking commandment. It didn't move mountains. It simply said, don't eat. Wait seven days. Go kill everything. Spare nothing. But we human beings, we mess it up. We can't do the little things. We got to have something that will put us on a pedestal. Look how great I am. How obedient I am to God. How obedient I am to all the commandments of God. When in fact we're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites running around blaming everybody else. Please don't be that way. Please understand that God is looking for converted individuals willing to admit their faults. Go to God and confess to Him his, your faults, our faults, daily. For He is merciful and He will forgive and He has compassion. So I leave you this message today. Don't play the blame game. Don't blame others. Blame ourselves individually. Don't make excuses for our shortcomings. God knows that we're human, that we will make mistakes, that we're filled with carnal nature. But He's given to us His Spirit, and He expects us to use that Spirit just like King David did. And have our sins forgiven because we don't blame ourselves by blaming others. We don't get out of that trap. We don't get away from blaming ourselves by blaming someone else. Blaming someone else means we're willing to blame God. And God is without blame. 
and he wants you and me to be without blame too. It'll be a different world when we don't have the blame game being played anymore.